the prophecy of Isaiah. We've now reached presentation 28. In the light of God, what about other gods? Let's just look back for a moment to where we were in the previous presentations. Faced with exile, the people tended to blame God. He hasn't seen us through, they said, but God points out they brought it on themselves. Isaiah stressed to them that religious ritual, going through the motions of religion, is no substitute for right living. In fact, rituals of themselves have no intrinsic value. Now that's a message that all religions must take seriously. Religions can only be useful if they represent lives seeking to follow God. But amongst the people of Judah, they hadn't even kept the rituals going. God does not want to burden us with such rituals. God is seeking a relationship with human beings, you and me. And he seeks that the outworking of that will be right living. Because that makes life rich and full and free for all of us. The problem was the people of God, Judah, they had rebelled against God. They'd pushed God to the margins of life and the religion had become ritualized and corrupted. And we saw that rebellion, it destroys the very nature of the people of God. When the people of God are no longer listening to God, when they've pushed God to the margins, then the very reason for their existence is no longer there. An exile is inevitable. We've lifted ourselves away from God's protection and God's provision. But our reactions are often irrational. We excuse ourselves and blame others. We resist facing up to the rebellion reality, what we've actually done. And we don't understand how God actually works. And we want a kind of God who will just quietly forget our rebellion and let things go on as they always were. Much of this is being reenacted in the West today. It's worthwhile pondering that statement. When we rebel against God, when we push him to the margins, when we reduce our religion to sets of rituals, procedures through which we go, we destroy the very nature and reason of our existence. And in the process we destroy ourselves. Let's move forward. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first, I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. And what is yet to come? Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Blunt, straight words that Isaiah brings from God to the people of Judah. Now the description there is very strong. There's a kind of pile-up of descriptions of God. Lord, Israel's King, Redeemer, and then the Lord Almighty. I am the first, I am the last. God who made the universe. God who is the sovereign Lord of the universe. God who holds everything in being. God to whom all of us are responsible. God who looks after his people. And God speaks to us. Isaiah reminds them of things that had happened to them, the ancient people, brought into being away back in the days of Abraham, rescued from Egypt, taken from the wilderness, protected through the difficult years of setting up the nation. God speaks through events. 
and God speaks through people. People who'd listened to God, the great prophets down through the centuries. And God had shown them what would happen. And it did. Faced with the onslaught, faced with the collapse of the nation, faced with exile. God's got everything under control. We've messed up, we've rebelled, we pay the consequences for our rebellion. We've lifted ourselves out of God's protection. We've weakened our entire communities. We're ripe for being pushed into exile. And again, there are parallels with what's happening to the church in the West today. But God has a purpose and a plan through it all. God is unique. And when we think of other gods, we've got to remember that. And in our societies in the West today, that is one of the tragic things that is happening, that we have allowed to happen. That the God, the Lord of glory, he's being presented as just an alternative. All religions are equal and they're equally foolish is the kind of mantra of our modern media. Choose what you want, but don't let it get in the way of good things in society. But Isaiah says, stop. Look at the evidence. Look what God has done. Look what God has said. Look at the evidence. God controls events in history, and the people of Judah could see it if only they had eyes and see what had happened in the past. What happens isn't a surprise to God. But what happens is so often the logical consequences of our actions. God has given us freedom of choice. We take the decisions and the consequences are in as inevitable as night following day. And Isaiah pointed that out. The consequence of rebellion was an inevitability because of the behaviour of the people and their leadership. But through the great prophetic figures, the events of history can be interpreted. And through the great prophetic figures, what will happen can be foretold. The consequences, the way things are working out, how God operates, what he will do. God shows that to those who are prepared to listen. By contrast, all who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure up are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind, they are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol, which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand, they'll be brought down to terror and shame. That's what always happens. When we choose not to recognize God, the great creator God, when we choose to push him to the margins of our life and do our own thing, the inevitable outcome, we make gods from something else. Because that's the way we're built. We're built to relate to our creator. And when we push him out, then we create something to replace him. It may be a thing, it may be a concept or idea, but something is brought in. It could be physical, mental or spiritual, but we choose to worship something or someone other than God. We have created gods. Now the world of Satan can enter in there and his angels, demons, they can identify with our creations and then they start to gain power and control over us. It's worth pondering our Western society and the way things are going today. And we, the people of God, are part of that. We have compromised, we have rebelled, we've done our own thing, we've pushed God to the margins, we've used him as our rubber stamp, we ritualized him out of existence. We've created our own gods. And now these gods are controlling us. It 
In this stretch, Isaiah describes with vivid detail the great care that we humans exert when we're creating our idols. Now he pictures it in terms of making physical idols out of metal or wood. But think of the great care that we cultivate our modern idols today. We'll look at that at the moment. Isaiah mocks it. They're just made of wood and metal. And he would mock the idolatry that's present in our culture and societies today. You can't fabricate God from things or you can't fabricate God from our human abilities. God is bigger than any of that. There is no substitute. And yet we do it. We create our idols. And the Old Testament spends a lot of time hammering away at the dangers of idolatry. And yet we're doing the same thing today and destroying ourselves in the process. You see, that's always what we do. We were made to relate to our Creator. When we push Him out, when we rebel, we create a substitute. It always, always happens. And it comes today in our modern society. Possession, status, power and money. Now just look at how we cultivate these in all that we do. We seek more power. We seek more possessions. We seek status in society. We adulate those who've got status. We seek more money. Or we make the intellect our God. We know best. We can work things out. We can solve our problems. We're at the centre of the picture. We worship ourselves. Or we see God as just a creation, extension of his creation. And therefore the creation and divinity are confused. And even within Islam, if you look at Islam, you can see that the God that's created in the Quran is a God within the capacity of our human minds. A fabricated God. Not the God who's beyond our human minds. You can't work him out. But they've got him. They describe him. They've boxed him in. It's a creation of the human mind. <clears throat> and the great theologian John Ostwald said that. That's humanity. We want a universe in our own image. We want to define it. We want to dictate the benefits. We want to organise it. We think we're clever. But in the process we've lost the God of the creation. And Isaiah is stressing there is only one God. There is only one right way. Can't get round that. But essentially it's our pride and arrogance. They prevent us from seeing it. <clears throat> Let's move on into the next section. Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. And again, it's speaking about the people of Judah. I have made you. You are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all, you, all your trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. Faced with exile, the inevitable consequence of their rebellion, they became so weak they couldn't stand against the onslaught of Babylon. But they may have walked away from God, but God has not walked away from them. Their captors in Babylon but actually they're captives to sin and the rebellion. God redeems. He'll bring them back. He'll rescue them. But there is a need for human response. Look at the lines. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. God takes the initiative to rescue. 
but he looks for the response. Return to me. It's not a cop-out, not an opt-out. We have to respond to what God has done. And there's a beautiful picture there. And the same as the rising sun disperses the cloud and mist of the morning. So the rising sun of God's light and hope and action disperses the sins that destroy our lives. Released from exile, but more importantly, released from the effects of the rebellion. In exile, the people were learning. They were learning more of the ways of God and they needed the great prophet Ezekiel to teach them, to release them from the power of sin. God provides the resources and energy, but we must respond. Return to me, says God. And the metaphor here is the whole world celebrating. Don't take it literally, it's poetry. Celebrating what God has done. But what a deep insight that is. God displays his glory in his people. Let's translate it into the modern terms of today. God's glory is seen in the lives of his followers, the followers of Jesus today. Think of it in the West, think of it in our countries. God will display his glory in you and me. And it will be seen when we are transformed. Our rebellion is swept away like the morning mist. But we must return to God, turning away from our rebellion. He will do it, but we must respond. And God's glory will be seen in us. What a magnificent and beautiful picture for us. But what a challenge for us today. But let's move on. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of the servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited. Of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt. And of their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundation be laid. You see, that's what we have done. Rebellion does that. In Western society today, we have pushed God to the margins of life. We've locked him up in our churches. We've absolutely locked him up in our rituals. And we are replacing God by our modern idolatry. Now here's God's answer. Idols do nothing. You don't take status, money, possessions, rank, you don't take any of these with you when our lives are finished. And the gods that we've created in our minds, in our thought forms, and the way we think we are so clever, we don't have answers. Answers to the terrible and great problems of our modern living. God is active. He does things. Look at what's said here. Formed, stretches, spreads, foils, makes, overthrows, turns, carries, fulfills, and it doesn't stop there. They shall be, I will, who says, I will dry up, who says, I will accomplish, he will say, let it be rebuilt, foundations be laid. God acts. The idols that are the creations of our minds are the fabrications from his world around when we confuse the creation with God. God that we've created and limited within our intellectual understanding. They don't do anything. They can do nothing. God is active in life, in history, in the events of life. But it's an amazing insight. Cyrus, who actually released the people of Judah from their captivity 
was known as Cyrus the Great. His grandfather was also called Cyrus, so it's possible that Cyrus is a kind of title like Pharaoh, of kingship, of the Medio Persian area. But Isaiah saw that this pagan ruler would be an instrument to release God's people from exile. It's not so common in the Bible for someone to be named specifically by name, although it may be a generic name rather than a specific name. This continues on in the next chapter. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. In other words, someone that God was going to send to do a task. To Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armour. He stripped the power of the Babylonian Empire and took it over. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you, I will level the mountains, I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name, for the sake of Jacob my servant, that's the people of Judah, of Israel my chosen. I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honour, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. <clears throat> now, kind of an imagination this is being addressed at Cyrus. But Cyrus had not yet been born. So it's addressed to the people of Judah as if it's addressed to Cyrus. Let's just look at some of it. God is the sovereign creator and Cyrus will recognize this. History shows he did. He never became a follower of God, but he recognized the God of the people of Judah. And Cyrus would be elevated to power for the sake of God's people. And the impact of Cyrus the Great was simply enormous. Changed the whole of the nature of the Middle East. And God would work through Cyrus to carry out the events of life and history. And these would bring benefit to God's people. But God's purposes have never changed. God wants to make himself known to all humanity. That's his goal. That's why he brought the people of God into being. That's why the people of God in the West exist today. It's our only goal. It's what God wants from us. We have rebelled and failed, but his purposes have never changed. And the picture here is of Cyrus who will know. He will recognize the God of Israel. And in his actions, there will be benefit for the people of God. And from that, the possibility that the world might know. Taking out some of the words there, just to focus on some of the key points. The centrality of God. I am the Lord. The Yahweh. The self-existent one, the God of relationship, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. We can make our idols, we can fabricate in our minds or with physical objects, we can worship our rituals and our activities and our understandings, but God is God. So that people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. God's goal is that people will relate to him. Because when we relate to him, we get life at his best. And it's what God wants for us. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is unique. Alongside that, all the idols that we create, they're nothing. They're just human inventions. Now that little bit there in the original 
it literally would be read one making well-being and one creating not well-being. Difficult to translate. God has been described as the uncaused, the only uncaused cause in the universe. He's behind everything and there is nothing behind him. You see, we bring the disasters on ourselves by our decisions and actions. But that can only happen if God allows it. So why does God allow it? Because if God didn't allow it, he would contradict our human nature. He gave us free will. If he intervened and blocked everything to impose his will, then we do not have free will. If we are spiritual beings, then by definition a spiritual being possesses free will. <clears throat> there is a cold logic in this, which is captured in the original language, but is difficult to bring into English. The problem is this. <clears throat> we don't think God's unique, and in practice we build our own gods. And when we centre our lives on something other than God. Oh, just stop and ponder your life. Are there other things in your life? Physical things, material things, things in your brain, aspirations, desire for status, anything. That's not God. That's important to you. That you put alongside God or maybe push God to the margins. That's the inevitable consequence. God made us with free will, but he made us for himself. And we find our true fulfillment in a relationship with him. In the Western society today, that would be mocked and laughed at. But Isaiah would say, look at history. Look at the evidence. Look at what happens when people do centre their lives in God. The God who is the Lord of glory, not a God of our human mental creation. And just look what happens in life. There is a peace, a serenity and a purpose that's beautiful. What actually happened? We fast forward in history and we go into the book of Ezra. This is what Ezra reported. Set around about 539 BC, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfil the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah predicted it would be about it would be about 70 years before the temple would be re-established. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with freeval offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Exactly as Isaiah predicted, because God had given them prediction. Cyrus acknowledged God. He was the God of Judah. Same as Pharaoh did with Moses. But Cyrus didn't convert his life to follow God. The Jewish historian, round just after the days of Jesus, very reputable, but he reports that Cyrus had read Isaiah's prophecy. Now, we don't know whether that's true or not, but that historian has recorded it. But we do know from history that that is true. We do know from history that Cyrus came over and peacefully took over the kingdom of Babylon. We do know that he allowed people to go back to their own countries. We do know that he gave permission for the people of Judah to return to the land of Judah and build their temple again. We do know that he and his successors backed them. We do know that he gave them money and resources and returned the temple artifacts. What Isaiah said came true. That is true prophecy. 
That's what God said through Isaiah. God is unique. That means that God is truth. And one of the clever things that's happened in Western society today is to undermine the concept of truth. There is no truth, say people. Everyone's opinion is of equal value. Even though many opinions contradict all the evidence. God is the Lord of creation and controls the events of life and history. That is God's uniqueness built on truth. There is such a thing as truth. It's a deception to say there's not. And God wants all humanity to appreciate his uniqueness. Not idols. Because he's got a purpose for us. And today we are riddled with idolatry. In the West, our lives are run on idolatry of things, power, intellect, possessions. Let's get rid of idolatry, get God back to being unique. Why does he want us to appreciate his uniqueness? That's what we're doing. That's what they did in Isaiah's day, the nations round about and the people of Judah. Then our lives become centered on these things. And what we want conflicts with what other people want. So we end up damaging each other. And we can see that happening in the countries of the world today. We create our own gods, the things we want. It ends up with conflict. <clears throat> God is unique. He can't work them out and make them logically and create them in our minds. He got to make himself known, otherwise we can't know him. This is the fault of all religions. They create a God of their minds. The God of Isaiah, the great God, the unique God, revealed himself. And it happens in two main ways. Through the events of history and through the great prophetic figures. But see, that's where we go wrong. When we create our own gods, our own idols, we lose out on the best way of life that God wants and has for us. We lose out. And that's why God stands against idolatry. <clears throat> because when we understand who God is and his uniqueness, it brings our life into the balance of the way it could be, should be, and it's at its richest and most fooling, full and satisfying. Miss out on that, we lose out. Think of this. That's how Israel as a nation survived. If it hadn't survived, there would have been no people of God, there would have been no Jesus. And Jesus has brought a transformation to the world. <clears throat> Despite what people are saying, look at the evidence Isaiah would say. Look at what happened in the world where Jesus has become central, where he has been made known. The other gods, they will do everything possible to persecute the people of God. That's what's happening in the world today. And that's why. They want their, their selves or their belief system in control. They will not let it go. So we are perceived as a threat. They will lose their power. In Islamic lands it's writ large. In the great totalitarian states this is happening today in front of our eyes. And now it's growing in the West. Hang on to God the Lord of glory the creator. Resist the rebellion caused by bringing in other gods. And let's find life to the fullest and the greatest. And let's live beautiful lives and make an impact on those around. That is the prophecy of Isaiah. The 
and the next presentation will look more at God's ways.